Good morning. Good morning. Let's turn in God's Word to Ephesians 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4. You may have heard in the news, and it's something I believe we should pray for, that the president uh, had his younger, I think it's his younger brother, that uh, passed away yesterday. And I don't know what the cause was. He apparently was ill. He was in and out of the hospital multiple times the last three months, they said. But the president described him as his best friend and, you know, had suitable expressions of grief that one might expect. But we can pray that the Lord would use this in the president's life and his family members that other Christians around them would speak to them the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know the vice president makes a clear profession of faith and some other cabinet members even have said that they are born again Christians and have said things that would indicate they know the Lord. So pray that the Lord puts people in the president's path to share the gospel, especially that this might be an opening for him to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Ephesians 4 and verse 1. By the way, before I read, just thank you for praying. As you know, we got back safely. We had a good trip to Missouri. I shared the word uh, the week before last, three nights in an assembly in Beaufort, Missouri, a little group of saints, and we had a really good time looking into 2 Corinthians And then we moved over to Turkey Hill Ranch Bible Camp, where Ozark Family Camp was being held. And I shared four times there on the faithfulness of God. So if anybody wants recordings of those, that can be arranged. Uh, They're posted, they're being posted on my YouTube channel. So uh, that's one way you can watch them if you have internet or we can make you CDs. But anyway, your prayers were answered. The Lord gave us good safety and health and journeying mercies. We got caught in a traffic jam in Indiana on Friday. We were coming all the way from Jefferson City, Missouri, or a little beyond that, to Pittsburgh. And it ended up we got to Pittsburgh safely at 2 a.m. And so we were an hour delayed in Indiana, and yet we thought we never knew why the delay was. We, We assumed an accident. We had seen some police go up ahead. But we... Just prior to that, about 45 minutes before we encountered that traffic jam, we got detoured uh, erroneously, as it turned out, by our GPS app. And we were kind of frustrated that we kind of wasted some time riding around in a circle around Indianapolis. And we finally got back on the right road, and then we hit this traffic jam. But we, it occurred to us, well, maybe we would have been caught in whatever it was if the Lord didn't get us you know, permit us to be lost like that. I can't say it definitively, but many times we don't see the Lord's providences. We don't know what he's doing behind the scenes, but we know he does hold us and he is working for us. So we're thankful for that. And when I say us, I mean the body of Christ, believers, not just our family, of course. Okay, Ephesians 4 and verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So we come to the part of the book of Ephesians that Watchman Nee described as walk. Uh, The first part of the book has emphasized our position in Christ. He called that part sit, because remember that the earlier part of Ephesians says we're seated already in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. But the prominent thought here, even in verse 1, is walk. And we'll find out in chapters 4 and 5, there's a great deal said about how Christians are to walk. Now, we're obviously not talking about being ambulatory. I mean, moving, putting, uh, like one of the old Christmas specials had a song, put one foot in front of the other. I think it was Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Seem to remember Fred Astaire or somebody singing it. But anyway, could have been Red Skelton. I don't remember who exactly. But anyway, somebody singing, put one foot in front of the other. That's not the kind of walking we're talking about. We're talking about the Christian life. 
We're talking about walking with God. And it's something that you could see as far back as Eden, that the Lord God came in the cool of the day walking. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. And they, having by that point fallen, having rebelled and sinned against God, broken his commandment, they hid from God. And really the Bible is the story of how God wants to walk with mankind. That what our Christian faith is all about is a relationship. It's not just assenting to certain truths, although they are true and we do agree with them. It's not just believing certain propositions or logical uh, evidences, although there is logical evidence for what we believe. It's a historic faith in that God has worked through history. He's worked in time and space. Our Lord became flesh and dwelt among us. He walked in this earth. But it's also a relationship. As the Lord Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John 17, 3. So knowing the Lord or being saved is all about knowing the Lord. It's for the purpose of knowing the Lord and walking with the Lord. That's why marriage is such a good metaphor of salvation and one that Ephesians 5 is going to be using in comparison with Christ and the church. Because a marriage, the intention is not just that you get together and have a lovely ceremony and a good meal, hopefully, afterwards, okay? That's why at least the men go to the weddings usually. They anticipate the reception, the good meal that's going to happen. You know, if I'm going to sit through this, I might as well get fed is sort of the attitude. Well, very good. But I think everybody agrees It would be a terrible thing. It would be a travesty of what we call marriage if the only time the bride and groom came together was on the wedding day and they said, well, this was a beautiful day. We enjoyed the meal and weren't the flowers lovely and the cake, it was just beautiful and thank you for not smashing it in my face. Well, have a nice life. I'll never see you again. I mean, we'd say that's absurd. People who get married get married, ideally at least, because they love one another, they're committed to one another, they want to spend their lives together, right? And I've often had to remind my own wife of this. I married you because I want to spend time with you, because there's always some project to be done, and that might take her away from me. Now, I respect the projects, and they need to be done to a certain degree, and sometimes I have to go away too. But it's always reluctantly. It's always under protest. Now imagine if we look at our Christian life that way, and I trust you do, that you say, I want to walk with the Lord. That's my desire as a believer. I not only believe that Jesus came and died for me once upon a time, that that that's a real historic event, but I know the Lord as a living relationship. I walk with the Lord. I pray to the Lord and the Lord hears me. I read his word and through the word, the Lord tells me what he wants of me, tells me what he's like, tells me what he thinks of me and what his plans are for me. And I trust that we all have that view that we want to walk with the Lord. That's what Paul wanted for the believers in Ephesus and obviously beyond them to the other Christians as well. But that's the whole point In writing to them, he says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And he's working off of this tremendous knowledge of Christ, that Christ is doing something big in the universe, that he's building this church that before was unknown. It was a mystery. It was not revealed to man in the Old Testament. It was perhaps hinted at in certain things we can look back and see, certain prophecies and and certain truths. We can see them worked out to fuller extent in our church age than they knew about in the Old Testament. But the whole point is that God wants to show his manifold grace to the principalities and powers. He wants an object lesson of who he is and what he's capable of doing. And because of that, Paul was begging them to walk worthy of this calling. More on that in a moment, but look at how he describes himself. Now, Paul was not one to talk a lot about himself. He didn't write a great deal autobiographically. When he does, there's always some testimony reason. And sometimes it's a testimony to God's saving grace. When he says, for instance, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 
Christ Jesus came into the I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So he mentions himself so that we might know, you know, can God save a sinner? Can God save somebody really far estranged? Yes, says Paul. He, he actually saved me. He describes himself as a pattern of all long suffering. So how long and how, to what extent is God willing to go? How long is he willing to forbear and, and be long suffering toward someone in rebellion, someone in unbelief? Paul says, just look at me. For years, I thought to do many things against the name of Christ. I wanted to wipe out the Christians. And uh, when they were put to death, I gave my vote. I consented to it. I said, yes, this is what should happen to people like that. And yet, God had mercy on me, the chief of sinners. He saved me. So Paul says, look, in essence, look at me. I'm an example that no one is too bad to be saved. Uh, he would tell the believers in Philippi, in Philippians chapter 3, about his background to really give them a notion that boasting about our religious credentials and being self-righteous and saying, I'm a Jew or I'm a Pharisee or I'm of this tribe or that tribe or I go to uh, this church or I come from this family, that kind of mentality is fallacious because that's how he lived before he knew Christ. But when he met Christ, he said... I counted all those things that naturally and religiously that people would think were gain. I counted that to be rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him with a righteousness not mine own. I was seeking to go about making my own righteousness, he says. But now I see I need someone else's righteousness. I need the righteousness of God that can be had by faith in Christ. What Martin Luther would later call an alien righteousness. Not that it comes from Mars. But meaning it's not native to us. Because there's none righteous, no, not one. As the Psalms say, and Romans chapter 3 quotes that. But he addresses himself again here autobiographically saying, I... But why is he talking about himself? Well, it's his current experience. I, the prisoner of the Lord. Or some would translate it, the prisoner in the Lord. And it's a very interesting thing, isn't it? We know historically that at this moment, Paul is in bonds. This is one of the prison epistles. He's in chains, as it were. He's imprisoned by the Romans. And yet, he doesn't describe himself as a prisoner of Rome, although that would have been politically and historically accurate, of course. But he looks beyond his circumstance, and you know what he sees? He says, the Lord is providentially behind this. That I am the Lord's, and I'm walking with the Lord. The Lord is guiding me where I ought to go. And the Lord has deemed that right now, I should be a prisoner. So I'm not primarily the prisoner of Rome, although they are my immediate custodians. You know, they're the guys bringing me my food, whatever times a day they gave him. And, you know, they're the guys who give me exercise in the yard or whatever they did with Paul as a prisoner. Uh, they had certain duties toward him on a daily basis. But ultimately, I'm here for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've not been in prison because I've been an evildoer, a lawbreaker, or a bad Roman citizen, or something like that. You can go through Acts, and Acts makes the point over and over from beginning to last about the believers, is that they weren't the troublemakers. I know when the gospel came to Thessalonica, they said these who have turned the world upside down have come here also. So there's always people that look at believers and say, you guys are the problem. You're the round peg that doesn't fit in the square hole. You know, like Ahab said to Elijah in 1 Kings 18, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Well, who was really troubling Israel? It wasn't the prophet who spoke in the name of the Lord and, and pronounced judgment, that the judgment that God promised, incidentally, if they turned from the Lord to idols, which they did. And so God was only being true to his word. And so as much as that happened, it wasn't Elijah's fault. We say, don't shoot the messenger, right? And Elijah was just the messenger. He wasn't the troublemaker. Ahab and Jezebel, they were the troublemakers in chief. They were the ones bringing in Baal and Ashtaroth worship. They were the ones supporting those prophets. And so uh, they weren't 
Uh, they were the source of trouble rather rather than the believer. And same with the Christian church. And you can go through Paul's trials and acts, and they bear a striking similarity to the trials of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean his legal trials. Now you remember at the trials before various permutations of the Sanhedrin. In other words, there was the account that John 18 speaks about where he appeared before Annas and a small group. And then there was a larger group under Caiaphas. And then there was a group described, for instance, in Mark 15 as the whole band in the morning. And yet even then, uh, we know that probably not every single last one of them was in attendance because there were at least two members of the Sanhedrin that were not voting against Jesus, that were not voting to condemn. That would have been Nicodemus, of course, and Joseph of Arimathea. And so one of the later Talmudic traditions about capital cases, if you had somebody coming into court and being tried for their life, you had to have a unanimous gathering of the Sanhedrin, which it's obvious by reading the Gospels, it was probably not a full gathering of the Sanhedrin, and they were not unanimous. Not every one of them agreed on the verdict. What's more, they weren't to deliberate at night about these things, and they were to wait a certain number of days for witnesses for the defense to come forward, and they were only to condemn. We know this from Deuteronomy, never mind the Talmud. We know from Deuteronomy that God said, you need two or three witnesses to condemn. And they couldn't find two or three witnesses, could they? They could find two or three false witnesses. And they were pretty terrible false witnesses at that. But they found them, and they condemned the Lord on that false testimony. Now you remember, it was no better before Herod. And certainly no better before Pilate. And Pilate says, I find no cause of death in him. I find no fault in this man. And neither has Herod. You bring him to me and you say he's an evildoer. I can't find anything worthy of putting him to death. So I'm going to scourge him. I'll whip him. And that in itself would have been unjust, right? Because our Lord had committed no crime, much less no sin. And and there was no reason why he should be flogged. And yet Pilate thought, well, if they want to humiliate this man, if they want to give him his comeuppance, if they want to get higher at the expense of Jesus of Nazareth, I'll beat him, I'll humiliate him, and that'll be enough for him. But you remember the hatred of men, that that was not enough. And although our Lord was perfectly without spot and sinless and perfectly righteous, we might say, that they delivered the Lord to death and he was taken by wicked hands and crucified and slain, Peter would say in Acts 2. And you recall that the same thing was true of Peter and John before the Sanhedrin, that they were unjustly charged. You filled Jerusalem with this this doctrine and you mean to bring this man's blood on us. Well, wait a minute. I seem to remember in Matthew that you guys said, let his blood be on us and our children. Who's really guilty here? It wasn't the apostles who were preaching the good news. And by the way, they were preaching that, yes, the nation had rejected Christ. Yes, they had sinned in delivering him up to be crucified. But they were also preaching that Christ died in their place, that he was their substitute, and that they could be saved. So this wasn't an anti-Semitic rant. This wasn't some kind of loathing of Israel and against that people. It was all for the means of bringing them to see their sin and their need to repent and turn to Christ. And yet you go through and when you get to the trials of Paul, it's just like the trials of the Lord in that they say this man's a seditious person. This man is, you know, a threat to Caesar's authority. And you remember they told Pilate about Jesus that if you free this man, you are not a friend of Caesar. I mean, that's political suicide and it might be actual suicide to side with Jesus over Caesar. And Pilate made his choice, of course. He delivered up the Lord to be crucified. Same thing with Paul through the Acts. That those trials show you he's not guilty. He's not done anything worthy of death. But the reason he's suffering and the reason ultimately he's in prison is for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he recognizes that. I may be bound, but the word of God is not bound, says he. So here he calls himself the prisoner of the Lord. Now that is, of course, a very humbling truth. Because when you think, if it were me, I don't know about you. 
But I would be texting somebody if I had that technology in the first century. I'd be writing somebody or asking anybody who would listen, please pray that there's some judicial review here. Please pray that my case is heard on appeal. Or please pray that I get freed. Or, or please pray that the Lord does something supernatural. I mean, he sent an angel in Acts 12, and he broke Peter out of prison. Pray that happens with me. But Paul doesn't have that. Not that it's wrong, by the way, to pray for deliverance in a particular trial. But if God chooses not to deliver us, we have to understand what Paul was told in 2 Corinthians 12 when he prayed for physical deliverance from the thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. He prayed three times that the Lord would take it away from him. And the Lord said, I'm not taking it away. Rather, I'm going to give you grace to bear it. My grace is sufficient for thee, is what he said. And it was the same thing with his imprisonment. Paul wanted to be freed. He says that in Philippians 1. If I can be freed and I trust by your prayers, I shall be, that I'll be delivered and I'll be able to come again and preach among you again. He wanted to continue his work for the Lord. And if he was now imprisoned, even there in prison, he was working for the Lord, right? Because he says again in Philippians 1, that because of his bonds, all day in the praetorian, in the palace, among the guards, in other words, all of they had heard the gospel. And at the end of Philippians in chapter 4, he says, they that are of Caesar's household greet you. Who knows? Maybe some people had gotten saved through Paul being in there. I don't know if you remember my friend Ramalingam from Singapore, the Indian ethnically Indian brother, but Singaporean national. He was here some years ago, early in our marriage. I don't remember how many kids we had, or I know we had at least Anastasia. So we're going back maybe 10, 11 years. But this brother Ramalingam, his testimony was that before he got saved, he was a gangster. And for uh, things he did, but also due to some political situations that were happening, he was put in prison. And when he got to prison, they said to him, now you can go into the library and you can pick out one book. But they said, make it a good one because you won't get to pick anything else out for a month. And he was literally in a cell that was like a big cage. And on four corners, there were four guards. Now he was considered highly dangerous. He was uh, kind of a, you know, maybe six feet tall, kind of a stocky fellow. And in his youth, he was an expert in the martial arts. So he was a very feared street fighter and a dangerous guy. And so he went into the library. He reached up. He grabbed the biggest book that was on the shelf without looking at it. He got to the cell. He got in the cell, looked at it, and it said, Holy Bible. Boy, was he upset. <laughs> he was really mad. But, you know, eventually he's sitting there in the cell with nothing to do. Boredom got the better of him. And he said, well, maybe I'll, I'll read a little of this. He started reading it. He came to something like the Lord saying, love your enemies. He said, oh, this is terrible. Threw it across the room, you know. And he got bored again after a while. And he started to think, hey, I seem to remember the Bible talks about wars. Maybe there's something I can read in there that will help me against my enemies. And can you imagine reading the Bible to figure out how you can beat your enemies in a fight or something? <laughs> well, he started reading again. And it went back and forth like that. He'd read a little, get mad, put it down, get bored, pick it up again, read some more. Well, eventually he got saved just reading the Bible. No Christian there, nobody witnessing to him. I don't know that anybody had ever given him a clear presentation of the gospel of Christ. I'm pretty sure not. Just by reading God's word, he got saved. So then he said, what was I going to do with all my time? Well, he said, I decided I would stand in the middle of the cell and I would read at the top of my voice the Bible. And as he read, he said over the coming weeks, first one guard got saved and then another guard got saved and a third guard got saved and the fourth guard got saved. And eventually, Brother Ramalingam got let out and eventually went into the Lord's work. And uh, as of the time we visited Singapore back in 2006, I think it was, uh, or maybe seven, 2007. Yeah, anyway, Naomi's giving me the nod. 2007, for accuracy. He was one of the few people that they would let into their maximum security prison to preach. But they would let him in there. Now, what a testimony. But it reminds me of Paul here, that Paul didn't get saved in prison, but by Paul being in prison, it seems like other people got saved. And he says in Philippians 1 that 
other people also got emboldened, other believers who hadn't been stepping forward, hadn't been as bold in their witness as they should have been. They said, wait a minute, if Paul's willing to suffer for this, we ought to step up and be willing to suffer as well. And what's more, Paul can't go around preaching and traveling like he used to. Let's get up and do it. Now, it's true, there were some that had ulterior motives. They wanted to build their own popularity. Uh, But he said, nevertheless, I rejoice that Christ is preached. As long as they were preaching the true gospel, Paul never had any sympathy for people that are charlatans, people that preach false gospels. But if you're a believer and you're preaching the gospel, yet you want to get your name in lights and you want to be famous, well, Paul says that's not the worst thing in the world if you're preaching the true gospel. Not that he was advocating people preaching to make themselves famous or something like that. But he here calls himself the prisoner of the Lord or prisoner in the Lord. Now think about that. If somebody is going to say to you, here I am in prison for the gospel. I'm willing to suffer for this gospel. Look where I am. I'm a prisoner, but I'm viewing these things through Christian lenses. I see this from the standpoint that God is sovereignly appointed that I'm here in this place. Though I don't like prison, though it's not... You know, something you would obviously have prayed for. He can see God's hand in it and he wants to be used. So then he tells them, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, would you not take that seriously? If I came to you today and I said, you know, a believer over in China, let's say, where there are a number of believers in prison for the faith, a believer who's been in prison for 20 years in China, wants to bring a message, wants me to give this message to the saints at Gilbertsville. Would you not perk up and listen? (laughs) You'd say, yes. I mean, I want to know a man who has that kind of credibility, who has suffered for the Lord. I want to hear what he has to say. So Paul's an apostle, a witness of the risen Christ. That carries its own authority. But all the more so, the fact that he's the prisoner of the Lord. He says, I beseech you. This is strongly urging them to walk worthy of the calling with which they were called. Now, you remember back in chapter 1, he prayed about the calling. Just look back at chapter 1 a moment here. Chapter 1 and verse 18. He says, this is what he was praying for for them. We're in the middle of the prayer in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, God has called us, called believers, to receive an inheritance in Christ. And he was praying that the eyes of their understanding would be open to understand the great glory of that calling. To understand the privilege that's been given us in Christ. That as we turn our eyes on Jesus, if you borrow the language of the hymn, and we look full in his wonderful face, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That Paul is praying that they can look at what they have in Christ, that inheritance in him, and say, you know, anything on earth is a a far distant thing from what we have in Christ. Why we are to live, why we exist, is to enter into this great inheritance that God calls us to. These great riches, blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus, knowing the Lord for eternity and all of the glory. Now, that should affect how we live right now. I mean, if you knew that one day you were going to run a Fortune 500 company, that someday Jeff Bezos is going to get tired of uh, sending out his delivery men to run over children's soccer balls in the streets. Oh, sorry, that's a, that's a family thing. But anyway, you, you were going to get tired of making all these business decisions and Bezos wants to go off and sail around on a yacht or something and enjoy his billions. And he taps you to be the CEO of Amazon. Now, how would you run Amazon? Well, if you're like me, who have never really read the business section of the Wall Street Journal, who's not read one management book by Peter Drucker, who doesn't have an MBA from Harvard, or let's keep it local, from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. If you've never really prepared, the thought of being put in charge of thousands and thousands of workers with billions of dollars at stake, 
That would scare the stuffing out of me. I'd be absolutely not ready for that job. But if you've been working along, that you've worked your way up, and this is the way it used to be, and you know that you read these stories about people that started out as a clerk, like Andrew Carnegie started out as a clerk in a business, and then he worked his way up, and he, he made it into management, and he bought some stocks, and then he was able, by making some money there, to broker some deals, and then become the head of a company, and then he was able to buy other companies, and the next thing you know, he's the wealthiest man in the world. Now I'm summarizing years and years. You can read David Nassau's biography of Carnegie if you're interested, but it's really a sad life because at the end of it, he realized he had done a lot of bad things to make his fortune. And that's one reason why toward the end of his life, he turned toward philanthropy, trying to assuage his troubled conscience. Unfortunately, I've never read or seen any account that he ever turned to the Lord. That would have been good, right? To turn in repentance for the things he regretted, the things he had done that were wrong and sinful. But if you've been preparing all the way along, then to step into that big job, well, you're ready for it. Well, think of the big job we've got ahead of us. I mean, this life is not all there is. We preach that in the gospel, right? We go on forever. And what do you think you're going to be doing forever, brother or sister? And you're not going to be hanging around on the proverbial cloud playing the harp all the time, okay? That is a, I don't know, a Daffy Duck caricature of heaven. Maybe it was before Looney Tunes. So as much as I like Looney Tunes, uh, their idea of heaven leaves a lot to be desired, right? You read what the Bible tells us about heaven, and so many of the parables of our Lord connote responsibility, they talk about stewards. They talk about people that have been given responsibility. They talk about being made a ruler over a city or a few cities or over many cities. They talk about tremendous things that God wants to do. You remember that Isaiah 9 says about the coming kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. Well, government needs administration, right? You need governors. You need people in the government that are taking action. So that's us. And in light of what we're called to, he says, I want you to walk worthy of that calling. Now, as a Christian, I can all too easily fritter away my life. You say, well, I can't be praying 24-7, Keith. I can't be studying the Bible all the time. I mean, you know that old refrain, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Don't know if that was exactly what the dwarves sang, but uh, something like that. And people say, I have to go to work, you know. I have to make a living. I remember the Lord talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, don't be like the Gentiles. That the Gentiles, they're always worried about what am I going to eat? What am I going to put on? What am I going to do? You know, how am I going to get to the top of the ladder? They want to lord over one another. But you, what should you do? Well, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, was the Lord saying, don't go to work, or don't go to school so you can get a good job, or... Don't apply yourself in your studies or don't apply yourself in the job you do. No, but the Lord was saying, in what you do, make sure the primary consideration is the kingdom of God. In other words, as Colossians 3 later puts it, that whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord. So if you're a plumber, you know, be the best plumber for the Lord. If you're a computer programmer, be the best programmer for the Lord. If you're an engineer or a school custodian or whatever you are, be the best at that for the Lord. It goes to being a homemaker, obviously. It goes to being a single person. It goes to being a married person. Whatever state we're in, we're to use it for the Lord. Now, Paul was just the same. You, you might say, well, Paul, you don't know about my life. You don't know what I have to do. Paul says, look, I'm a prisoner. But even imprisonment can be used for the glory of God. Even being a prisoner, I'm not Rome's prisoner. I'm not at their beck and call. I'm not at their mercy. God is over Rome. 
God can put down Rome whenever he wants. God raised up Rome. God put down the empires before Rome, right? He put down the Greeks. He put down the Persians. He put down the Babylonians. And on and on and on. God raises up the powers that be and he puts down the ones that he wants to. So Paul says even imprisonment can be used for the Lord. So can I be a student for the Lord? Absolutely. And some of the great revivals of history have been carried on by students, have started with students. You can think about the St. Andrews Seven, who were seven students at St. Andrews University in Scotland, not just the birthplace of golf, but a world-class university where a great theologian of the early 1800s, Robert Chalmers, taught. And he inspired these seven students, and they went on to do great things for the Lord in different parts of the world. Uh, You can think about uh, people like those students at uh, what later became Brown University, I think it was, and maybe also Williams College in Massachusetts back in the early 1800s who formed a prayer meeting and made a vow to pray about missions work. And out of that movement of students went forth the first missionary probably out of the early United States, as far as we know, at least to the foreign field, the great Adoniram Judson, who went to Myanmar. And you can read his biography, the one by um, Courtney Anderson is particularly good, called To the Golden Shore. But Judson had this tremendous ministry. It took him six years to see one convert. But then over the decades, God used him and he translated the Bible into Burmese and he laid the foundation of the church and the people that are working for the gospel in Myanmar today, what we now call Burma, they say, you know, we're still building on that work that God used Adoniram Judson to do. And it all started back when he was a student and what God was doing back there among students. Uh, You know, can it happen among older people? Well, of course, Caleb had that attitude in the Bible. Give me this mountain, he said. No talking about sailing off into the golden years and just kicking back and enjoying myself, you know. No, I'm going to go full tilt for God. This is what Paul means when he talks about walking worthy of the calling with which we are called. We'll see in the next message what that looks like in practical terms. I mean, it's a lofty ideal, isn't it? To say, I want to live and walk and conduct my life in keeping with what the Lord has for me, what he's called me to. Not just called me to in this life, it begins in this life. When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. But it's eternal life. It's beyond this temporary world, isn't it? It goes on and on and on. And you better believe God is an indolent. He doesn't stop working and stop doing what he does through eternity. And we're going to worship and serve him through eternity. So it behooves us to learn to walk in the proper way even now. Father, we are thankful for thy word. We pray we'd take it to heart and it would have practical effect that others would see even by how we walk with thee in this world that it would be a walk that's worthy of this calling, that we live differently because there's so much at stake. There's so much we're being prepared for, and we don't want to waste our lives. Father, help us to use every circumstance and turn to thee in it and say, Father, how may we glorify thee? If Paul could be a prisoner of the Lord, I can be a senior citizen for the Lord. I can be a working man for the Lord. I can be a student for the Lord. I can be married or single for the Lord. I can be a neighbor in this neighborhood for the Lord. Let us see our lives like that, that we are the Lord's and we must live for his glory. We pray it in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen.